you're going to introduce Carl, the second service. Okay, Carl, you don't get to introduce the first service, okay? Okay. All right. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for today, and we do uh, thank you for the opportunity we have to join and to listen and to learn. And Father, I just pray that you just touch our hearts, our minds, help us to retain what we hear this morning. And Father, I just ask your blessings upon this time. For its name is Jesus, we pray. Amen. Are you using this? Or? Yeah. Thank you. Handheld. Well, good morning, everybody. You don't know who I am because they didn't introduce me, so you'll figure out who I am in the second service. Um, thank you guys for, <laughs> thank you all for letting me come and uh, be with you. I mean that sincerely. Uh, my first time in Winslow, and uh, I, I know Frank and April were here last year. They send their greetings. They uh, sincerely appreciated the kind hospitality that you all showed to them. Um, I'm not sure where they are this weekend. I know they're somewhere. We're, we're running. Um, but they have moved into their house. So those of you that have been praying for them, they sold their house in Hawaii, and they have moved from Minnesota down to the uh, tropical Winona Lake, Indiana. So compared to where they were in Minnesota, it's tropical. So, uh, but uh, yeah, they've just moved in literally last week. They finally got everything moved in. Uh, so thank you for praying for them. Uh, this morning's talk, I'm going to warn you in advance, this one is a lot of information. I like to have a lot of interaction with my presentations and that sort of a thing because I'm working with younger generation. But when it came to this topic, this one was really hard to do that with because there's just so much information that has to be communicated. So I'm kind of warning you. Um, I will try and slow down. Those of you that were there yesterday, you know that I speak quickly. Uh, I will try to slow down. I cannot guarantee it, but I will try. Uh, junior, I'm sorry, sophomore, junior, senior high schoolers, I wanna, I'm going to make this announcement every session because I truly want them, if you've got one of them in your life, get them to Ankeny, Iowa this summer, June 23 to 28, bring them out to uh, take a college class with us. It's three credit hours, transferable, you don't have to go to faith. It is probably the best week, one of the best weeks of my life. I love the camps as well, but... This is one of the best weeks because I get time to flesh things out and it's not just a talk and run kind of a thing. So we get to dig and we're, then we do life afterwards because we're talking in the chow halls and all that kind of a stuff. So, uh, but anyway, get your young folks there. If, uh, if they are really interested in wanting to take this topic and go a little bit deeper because it's definitely worth it. So, uh, but this morning we're talking about there is no evidence for Jesus' resurrection debunked. The resurrection has got to be at least in the top two of the most important things that have happened for a Christian. It's spoken of over 120 times in the New Testament, so obviously it's important. Uh, Matthew 28, let's just give you some verses here, just a few. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who is crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. And we see this throughout the Gospels over and over again. Jesus, he was crucified. He was risen. Luke, Jesus, he is risen. He was crucified. John, we read, Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. So we have this teaching that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. And it's a vitally key important aspect to our faith. But let's be honest. Come on. You can't believe in some dead guy rising. It just can't happen. Science has proven dead people don't rise. And this younger generation is mocked and ridiculed. You believe that a dead man rose? You believe that a snake can talk, a donkey can talk? If you want to get this generation to not trust the word of God, it is very simple. 
Just ask them questions about their faith. This is one of the questions we're dealing with this time. Is, is there any evidence for the resurrection? So before I get into this, I'm going to pray. And I thank you again for letting me be with you. So Heavenly Father, I lift this up to you. May you be glorified. I have nothing. I just give what I have to you. And it's amazing what you can do through broken pieces, through <laughs> folks that don't have a whole lot. So God, that's us. We give it to you. We ask you to use whatever it is that's usable. Take away what's not usable and help us to conform more to you. I thank you in advance what you're going to accomplish. In Jesus' name, amen. Consider the following statement made by an atheist. I know there was no resurrection because I know from science that dead people stayed dead. Anybody know what atheist made that? Who? Presumably, what happened to Jesus was what happens to all of us when we die. We decompose. Accounts of Jesus' resurrection are about as well documented as Jack and the Beanstalk. So is that true? Is something that is so vitally important to the Christian faith about as valid as Jack and the Beanstalk? Is it true? Well, let's address it. Hopefully I can give you information that will make you want to go dig deeper, right? I'm giving you superficial stuff. I just bought a book by the guy that I'm going to be using from here. He's doing his, what do they, what do they call that life's work? Magnus Opus, is that what it's called? Magnus Opus, his life's work on the resurrection. He's a retired professor from Liberty University. I just bought volume one. It's this thick. He's using nothing but secular sources to show the resurrection. There's seven volumes. Volume one is this thick. I'm giving you like this thick. But I want to show you that you can go dig deeper and get more if you're really interested in this topic. So hopefully that's what this is going to be. So what are some claims made about Jesus Christ? And let's see if we can back it up with actual evidence. Uh, he was a real person. The Bible claims that. Can I get an amen? Thank you. He died via crucifixion. And he rose from the dead. That should be the loudest amen right there because that is so vitally important to us. So the question is, is there evidence to support those three claims and not just from the Bible? This is what I find very interesting because me, I'm the guy that I love to take what I see in the world and critically evaluate it. Because in my humble opinion, if God's word is true, if God is who he claimed to be, what I see in the world should be consistent with what I read in the word of God. I should not have to jump through hula hoops to make the scripture make sense. Typically, the people that are jumping through hula hoops are doing it to try to twist scripture to fit with what we think man knows. We don't need to jump through loops. We need to just take it and be straightforward with it. I am too heavy to tap dance as if you couldn't tell. I am going to be straightforward with you. If I tried tap dancing, I'm breaking an ankle, all right? So we're just going straightforward. This is what the Word of God says in Matthew 11, 4 and 5. He presented himself alive to them after suffering by many proofs. Man, if there's many proofs, then there's, we should be able to find some. Appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. So let's take a look and see if we can't find some of those many proofs that supposedly are out there. John 14, 11 said this. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. So if these works were done, there should be records of it, there should be information, people should have known about it, and did they? And do they? Gary Habermas is the gentleman that I told you about. He is probably the leading expert on the resurrection. He uses what he calls the minimal facts approach. Now, if you're anything like me, the first time that I heard this and was exposed to it, you're like, uh, what's that? What's the minimal facts approach? So I'll flesh it out for you. There's a, sh a small book, if you want to do an introductory level on this topic, um, it's called The Case for the Resurrection of Jesus, okay? The minimal facts approach is this. These are facts, they have to meet two very specific criteria. They're very well evidenced and nearly every scholar accepts them. And I'm not just talking about Christian scholars. This approach considers only those data that are so strongly attested historically that they are granted by nearly every scholar who studies the subject, even the rather skeptical ones. 
So that's what I'm going to be giving you this morning. The stuff that's accepted even by the skeptics, even by the guys who say, look, he never rose. We don't believe that. But this is what we see in history. All right? Uh, so let's start with the first one. He was a real person. Because why would we start there? Well, if he wasn't a real person, there's no reason to go on to the other two. So we have to show that was Jesus a real person? Or is it just some figment of our imagination, something made up because we got a bunch of, you know, peasants that uh, are looking for some kind of hope out there, right? Well, let's start with an antagonist. His name was Celsus, and he was an antagonist. In 170 AD, he wrote the first all-out and informed attack on Christianity he called the true word. So this was the first guy to really attack Christianity in the written publication, 170 AD. You know what? They're apologists even back then. And by the way, do you know what I mean by an apologist? Not somebody who's apologizing because they believe in Christianity. We have enough of those. Those aren't apologists. Those are lukewarm. An apologist is somebody that does what God called them to do, which is to give an answer for the reason for the hope that lies within them with meekness and fear. And that word answer literally means a logical, rational explanation why you believe what you say you believe. That's, that's what it means. And by the way, who is called to be an apologist? A certain segment in the church? Just the top 10%? Only the guys that graduated from college? No. You claim Christ, you're supposed to be an apologist. You're supposed to be able to give an answer for the reason for the hope that lies within you with meekness and fear. So Origen, maybe you've heard that name, Origen wrote a response to uh, the attack. Uh, he was the Church of Alexandria. He responded with one of the first apologetic books called Contra Celsum or Against Celsus. So you're going to hear a lot of quotes and that type of a thing from me. So what I've tried to do is find some other video clips to bring in, reading the quotes so that you don't hear my voice for an hour, okay? So I found this quote from Origen quoting Celsus, okay? And it's got an accent, so maybe it'll wake you up a little bit. It's, you know, it's fun. I go over to England, and they're like, oh, it's the only place on the planet that I've ever spoken at where they call me brilliant. <laughs> brilliant. Yeah, thanks, man. I mean, lovely. I'm brilliant and lovely in England. <laughs> but anyway, oh, we love your accent. Like, dude, I don't have the accent. You got the accent. It's awesome. So here we go. This is uh, just a quote from the writings but in a different voice. A few years ago, he began to teach the doctrine, being regarded by Christians as the Son of God. He invented his birth from a virgin and was disgracefully born in a certain Jewish village. Of a poor woman of the country who gained her subsistence by spinning, she was turned out of doors by the carpenter to whom she'd been betrothed, having been guilty of adultery, and that she bore a child to a certain soldier named Pantera that after being driven away by her husband and wandering about for a time, she disgracefully gave birth to Jesus, an illegitimate child, who, having hired himself out as a servant in Egypt on account of his poverty, and having there acquired some miraculous powers on which the Egyptians greatly pride themselves, returned to his own country, highly elated on account of them, and by means of these proclaimed himself a god. So that's one of the earliest attacks against Christianity from Celsus, all right? Now, here's what I find interesting. From the antagonist, we learn this. From Celsus, we learned that it was believed that Jesus was born of a virgin, right? Right? That's what he was attacking. So it was known that he was born of a virgin, at least claimed to be. Not that they agreed with it, but they knew that it was being claimed to be that Joseph was a carpenter, that Mary was found to be pregnant and not by Joseph, that Jesus had been in Egypt, that he had powers, and he also was called God. You see, all of those things that we just learned from the mocker, we just learned. It wasn't fairy tale. It wasn't made up. It was known. Now, it doesn't mean that they agreed with it. But it was something that was going on in the culture, and people didn't come along and make this up years later to try to fit some sort of belief. Was Jesus a real person? Uh, I can't say this gentleman's last name. Lawrence, yeah, history professor. 
This is what he wrote. Jewish rabbis who did not like Jesus or his followers accused him of being a magician and leading people astray, but they never said that he didn't exist. So even in the mocking, we can verify that Jesus was there. Didn't like him, mocked him, but that means that he was there to be mocked. Interesting uh, paper, The Guardian. It is not a Christian publication, not a Christian publication. What is the historical evidence that Jesus Christ lived and died? I saw that and I thought, oh boy, this is going to be good. They're really going to mock and ridicule, right? Because this is an antagonistic newspaper out of England. So I read down, I scrolled down here, and I read this. The historical Jesus of Nazareth is both long established and widespread. Within a few decades of his supposed lifetime, he is mentioned by Jewish and Roman historians as well as by dozens of Christian writings. That's a secular, antagonistic newspaper. A Jewish historian, you've heard this name, Josephus, he wrote, now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. So to the first claim, is there actual evidence to support that Jesus was a real person? Oh yeah, I gave you just a couple. You wanna go do digging? Don't believe me, go dig. I know what you're going to find. I'm comfortable. But what about this? He died via crucifixion. Now, before we get into the crucifixion, we have to understand something. Crucifixion was not a good thing. Crucifixion was a common form of execution used by the Romans to punish the lower class, the slaves. and It was used on the, the bad people. Is there any evidence that they even crucified? Because I've actually had people tell me there's no evidence that the Romans ever crucified. Ah, not true. Because there is actual physical evidence. This is a foot bone with a nail run through it. Very rare. I think I've found three instances of this. Another ankle bone with a nail hole through it. Another ankle bone with a nail through it. So very rare, but there is actual physical evidence that people were crucified. So you gotta throw that one out. Oh, the, no, the Romans didn't crucify. No, that's, don't even bring that, that's a bad argument. They did. That doesn't prove that Jesus was crucified, but it was going on. As a matter of fact, I can even show you, not even from physical evidence, but I can give you some historical evidence from a Roman statesman, Cicero. And this is what he wrote, that crucifixion was the most horrendous torture he continued on, this is how bad it was, okay? This is how bad crucifixion was. The very word cross should be far removed, not only from the person of a Roman citizen, but from his thoughts, his eyes, and his ears. They shouldn't even say the word. It was so horrendous. So it was real. But that doesn't prove that Jesus was crucified. How can we do that? Let's go back to our favorite Jewish historian, Josephus. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men among him, had condemned him to the cross, what do you think that means? That's crucifixion. Jewish historian, not a Christian. But let me take you to a Roman senator and see what he said. Now, uh, you got to understand something about Tacitus. Tacitus was the emperor of Rome. Remember, two-thirds of Rome was, if you remember history, was destroyed by fire and uh, they, they blamed the Christians for it. And that's when really crazy persecution started taking place on Christians in Rome is because he blamed them, right? Uh, well, not Tacitus, but Nero did. And Tacitus, uh, what happened was is Nero wanted to build gardens close to the palace. They rejected it. So what did Nero do? He started the fire to, build, to burn out all that stuff so that he could then build what he wanted, all right? Uh, but Tacitus wrote about it, and this is what he wrote. So I, I said that incorrectly the first time. Nero's the guy that did the burning. Hello, hello, hello. Thank you. But Tacitus wrote about it. And he said to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite torture. What do you think that was? On a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty. What do you think that is? During the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate. Guys, that's a Roman senator. That's not a Christian. He wasn't a deacon in the church. 
Remember our guy that I can't say his last name? If you want to attack Tacitus and say that, well, you know, he wasn't a very good historian. They weren't really good at their jobs back then. Tacitus was among Rome's best historians, arguably the best of all, at the top of his game as a historian and never given to careless writing. So yes, we have documentation from a Roman statesman that Jesus was crucified. Uh, there's an antagonist. This is an interesting guy. Antagonist, Lucian of Samosata, an Epicurean. Okay, now, Epicurean. Anybody remember Epicurean? What do you know about Epicureans? Anybody know anything about Epicureans? It's an interesting study. Go do some study in Epicureans. They were a follower of Epicurus. Come on. But who was Epicurus? He was an antagonist. You've read about him, right? In Acts, Acts 17, 18, it says this, some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. So who were the Epicureans and what did they believe? Well, here we go. Among other things, they believed that the goal of human life was happiness resulting from absence of physical pain and mental disturbance. Huh. I found a book. This was a number of years back, and I'm reading this book, and I came across this quote. I thought, well, oh, that sounds like a lot of people that I know today. I mean, give me the, give me the, let's lick some frogs so that we can go into this wonderful trance and then the whole world disappears on me. I know these people. Let me just knock myself out with drugs so that I don't have to physically. It's there. But this is the quote that I got that really hit me. Epicurus, most prominent disciple without question. Who do you think the most prominent disciple, according to this writer, was of Epicurus? Trying to find a way just to live life, you know, pain-free and... Charles Darwin. I was like, what? Darwinism is not only the most recent incarnation of Epicurean philosophy, but almost the most potent formulation of that philosophy to date. I found that very interesting. That even, you know, we think that like evolution and all that stuff is like a modern day problem. Oh, it's not. It goes back to ancient times, man. It goes way back. They just use different terminology, but the same teaching was there. So Epicurean, he was an Epicurean satirist. Lucian of Samosata, he wrote in one of his plays, The Passing of Peregrinus, around 165 AD. He was not a Christian, openly mocked them, and he made the main character in, his, in this play a murderer and a child molester. And this guy, flo he fleed to Palestine where he tricks Christians into believing him to be a prophet second only to Jesus. So in this play, this is what he wrote, and take a listen. The Christians, you know, Worship a man to this day, the distinguished personage who introduced their novel rites and was crucified on that account. Oh. He continues. You see these misguided creatures? Guys, you think we got it bad today? You think the mocking and the ridicule that we face today is tough? Are you kidding me? What they did to Christians in the past was unbelievable. We're just seeing this. It's going to get crazy. Hang on. It's going to come back. That's negative. That's a downer. No, that's reality. But we don't, still don't have to be afraid because God is still in control. We don't give up and hide and run. No. We know what's coming. All right, Lord, use us. These misguided creatures start with a general conviction that they are immortal. Ooh. For all time, which explains the contempt of death and voluntary self-devotion, which are so common among them. And then it was impressed on them, that, uh, them by their original lawgiver that they are all brothers. From the moment that they are converted and deny the gods of Greece and worship the crucified sage and live after his laws. Hmm. So what did we just learn from Lucian? The antagonist. That Christians worship Jesus after his death. They believed that they had eternal life. They weren't afraid of death. Sacrificially served others and visited prisoners. They believed they were spiritual brothers with one another. By the way, I said this yesterday, and I'll probably say it a couple more times. You want to deal with all the ugly, crazy stuff that we got going on in our world right now where there's a breakdown between people because you look this way, you have this skin tone, you have this eye shape, you speak this language, and therefore, you want to break that down? There's only one way. His name is Jesus because we're all... We're all related. There's one race, the human race. It's the only answer that we've got to this issue. It's not going to work from any of man's wisdom. 
They denied polytheism and paganism, and they believed Jesus died by crucifixion. So guess what? In the ridicule, there's still confirmation. We've got to go back to Origen and Celsus. Let me give you another quote, because I found this one was very good. You mock and revile the statues of our gods. But if you had reviled Bacchus or Hercules in person, you would not perhaps have done so with impunity. But those who crucified your god when present among men suffered nothing for it, either at the time or during the whole of their lives. And what new thing has there happened since then to make us believe that he was not an imposter, but the son of God? So, from Celsus, we learn even more. We learn that Jesus was crucified. And Jesus was believed to be God. So again, Celsus, in his meanness, there's confirmation. Uh, John Dominique Croissant, interesting. He's a critic, and he wrote this. Jesus' death by crucifixion under Pontius Pilate is as sure as anything historical can ever be. That's a pretty ringing endorsement, is it not? Oh, man. You think this convinces him that Jesus was resurrected? No, because this is what he wrote. For if no followers of Jesus, now this is interesting, if no follower of Jesus had written anything for 100 years after his crucifixion, we would still know about him from two authors, not among his supporters. Their names are Flavius Josephus and Cornelius Tacitus. My point, here it is, my point once again is not that those ancient people told literal stories and we are now smart enough to take them symbolically, but they told them symbolically and we are now dumb enough to take them literally. So he doesn't believe that this happened, but historically, it's as trustworthy as anything else in history. He continues, Jesus' corpse was laid in a dirt grave, normally reserved for executed criminals, and was dug up and eaten by dogs, which is why they didn't find his body. Do you know what I'm going to now do with this? Right? From John Dominique Croson, we learned that Jesus' body was missing coming up with an excuse to make up for it. But guess what? Even in the doubt, there's confirmation. Why would he have to come up with some mechanism to explain why there's no body if there was a body? We have to start learning to look at these things differently. Another New Testament scholar wrote this, Jesus' crucifixion is one of the most, almost indisputable facts concerning Jesus. The most important book in Jewish culture, all right? Um, the, the, the Jewish Talmud wrote this. This is interesting. It was taught on the day before the Passover, they hanged Jesus. You know what they mean by hanged? Crucified. A herald went before him for 40 days proclaiming, he will be stoned because he practiced magic and enticed Israel to go astray. Let anyone who knows anything in his favor come forward and plead for him, but nothing was found in his favor, and they hanged him the day before the Passover. That's from the Jewish Talmud. So what historical evidence is there that Jesus lived and died? Well, this is interesting. Within a few decades of his supposed lifetime, he is mentioned by Jewish and Roman historians, as well as by dozens of Christian writings. And that's that secular newspaper. By the way, if you would, today, do me a favor. Just read 1 Thessalonians. Just, just 1 Thessalonians. Just read the first chapter, chapter 1. Just, just read that today, sometime. You know why I would ask you to do that? And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. That was written about 49 to 51 AD. This was written within 20 years of his crucifixion. There's no writings that have this type of documentation to back it up. Who was it written by? And notice that when Paul is writing to the Thessalonians, he doesn't start out by explaining what he means by Son of God, Messiah, Christ, or that he calls Jesus Lord. They knew what it, mean, it meant. He didn't have to explain those, that terminology to them. They knew what it meant. And this was written by who? And who was Paul? He was the persecutor. He was the one persecuting the Christians. When you have an encounter with Jesus, he changes everything. 
I don't care what you've done. I don't care who you are. When you encounter him, he changes everything. But what about Jesus specifically? Is there evidence that he died via crucifixion? Oh, absolutely. There's absolutely evidence to support that. And it's not just from the Bible. So now the biggie, the resurrection. Is there evidence that Jesus Christ rose from the dead? Is there secular evidence to support that? Let's go back to our favorite Jewish historian. Those that loved him at the first did not forsake him, for he appeared to them alive again the third day. Hmm. Yeah, but he was, you know, he was kind of, he was Jewish, so he had a bone to pick. Well, he had one to pick against it, quite frankly, but anyway. Let's go to another Roman historian, Suetonius, and he wrote this. The punishment was inflicted on Christians as class of men given to a new and mischievous superstition. Anybody want to go out on a limb and venture what that mischievous superstition was that the Christians were being persecuted for? They believed in the resurrection, so they were persecuting them. Roman senator, Senator Tacitus again. Christus, we read that, let's go on, and a most mischievous superstition, thus checked for a moment, again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome. So yes, even the people in Rome knew what was being said. I I, I find this one interesting too. Thallus um, wrote a history of the Eastern Mediterranean world from the Trojan War to his own time, and Julius Africanus can't find his writings anymore, but Thallus wrote about it, so we've got some clips from it. Thallus, in his third book of histories, explains away this darkness as an eclipse of the sun. Now, help me out here. Help me out here. Do you, do you know what he's referring to by this darkness? What happened when Christ was crucified? Thallus, in his third book of his histories, explains away this darkness as an eclipse of the sun. Why would he have to explain something in a way that never happened? Pliny the Younger, Emperor Trajan. Interesting correspondence here. He's writing the emperor, Pliny the Younger, and he says this, I have taken this course about those who have been brought before me as Christians. I asked them whether they were Christians or not. If they confessed that they were Christians, I asked them again and a third time, intermixing threatenings with questions. Man, we suffer so bad today. They call me a mean, nasty name. People at work won't talk to me anymore. If they persevered in their confession, I ordered them to be executed. So he's writing the emperor, hey, this is what I do. What do you think? By the way, what have they done to be executed? What justified the killing of these people? What what heinous crimes were they doing? Oh, you can't believe this. Pliny explains it. They were in the habit of meeting on a certain fixed day before it was light when they sang in alternate verses a hymn to Christ as to God. Now, if you heard my singing, you would want to execute me as well. I'm not going to lie. That's why I won't sing. I mean, I'm just not going to sing. I'll, I might lip sync some, but I'm not going to sing because I'm always afraid somebody's going to hear me sing and they're going to leave, right? But they worshiped on a certain fixed day and they sang to Christ as he was God. We got all oh, these criminals. Oh, but there's more. Hang on. Whew, I can't. I, I don't, it, it's safe, but this is bad and bound themselves by a solemn oath not to any wicked deeds, but never to commit any fraud, theft, or adultery, never to falsify their word, nor deny a trust when they should be called upon to deliver it up. Of course we got to get rid of those people. Are you kidding me? You can't have those people in society. I mean, come on. I mean, they meet on a specific day. They sing hymns to somebody that they believe is God. I mean, come on, they believed it was wrong to commit wicked deeds, fraud, theft, adultery, false way they were. You know what? From Pliny, we learned that in the attacking, there's confirmation. Is there secular evidence for this? Oh, absolutely. And guys, there's even more evidence to support the resurrection of Christ. But instead of me continuing on, Can I give you a condensed version to give you some nuggets that might 
wake you up a little bit. Is that okay? That was a lame response. People yesterday, you know what I'm talking about. Questions require response. My job is to put you to sleep. You're putting me to sleep. Okay? Is it okay to liven this up and show you something to drive this point home a little bit? Okay? Yeah. All right. Well, put your seatbelts on because I'm going to show you one of our debunked videos. I understand that your church has been showing them. Praise God. That's encouraging to me. We made those things because we want people to use them. So mature generation that weren't there yesterday that haven't seen one of these things, I'll say it again. It's safe. It's just fast. If you think I've been speaking quickly, oh, no. But you need to understand why they're fast, because we're trying to reach a generation that thinks different. It's just reality. So here we go. Now, lots of people say that there's no evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So all I'm going to do here is provide one line of evidence. It's unfortunate, but I just don't have the time to mention something like the half dozen facts developed by resurrection expert Gary Habermas, for instance. Minimal facts that even skeptics, atheists, and liberal scholars agree on. These facts are as follows. One, that Jesus died by crucifixion. Two, that very soon afterwards, his followers had real experiences that they thought were actual appearances of the risen Jesus. Three, that their lives were transformed as a result, even to the point of being willing to die specifically for their faith in the resurrection message. Four, that these things were taught very early, soon after the crucifixion. Five, that James, Jesus' unbelieving brother, became a Christian due to his own experience that he thought was the resurrected Christ. And six, that the Christian persecutor Paul, formerly Saul of Tarsus, also became a believer after a similar experience. Man, I wish I had the time to mention those, but I just don't. No time, good sir. No time, no time at all. I just don't have time to bring up what former atheist and law-trained journalist Lee Strobel said when he said, I figured it would be easy to disprove the resurrection. Give me a weekend and I can shred Christianity's central claim. Well, it wasn't that easy. After investigating the historical evidence, Mr. Strobel believed in the resurrection of Jesus. Watch the movie, read the books. Bummer I couldn't mention that to you. Ain't got time for this quote either. My job is to infer what is most reasonable from the list of evidences, said cold case detective J. Warner Wallace. After digging into the evidence, I was convinced that what the Bible claims about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is the best explanation. The only weakness in the case, and there are always weaknesses, was my own bias against resurrections. Now, since I don't have time to mention such things, let me just get right to my point, okay? My one and only line of evidence has to do with the appearances of Jesus after his death. This is recorded in an early creed cited by the aforementioned Paul the Apostle, which we find in his letter to the Corinthian church. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared also to me. Okay, there's a lot of people who saw Jesus after he was crucified and buried, and this is exactly why Paul was so confident to stand in front of Festus and King Agrippa and tell them the truth. It's in Acts 25 and 26. Here's a snippet. Paul says, I stand here testifying, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. Now Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, your great learning is driving you out of your mind. Not sure if that was his actual accent, but Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus. I am speaking true and rational words, for the king knows about these things. None of these things has escaped his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. In other words, all this was falsifiable. Everyone around town was talking about Jesus' resurrection. People had seen him. The tomb was empty. The stone was rolled away. The guards were perplexed. The religious leaders were mystified and tried to create a lie about what happened to the body. Paul, who was persecuting Christians earlier, was now one of them preaching the resurrection of Christ. None of this was hidden. It was all out in the open. So, my eclectic, evidence-eager evangelist, each ecstatically expecting an extraordinary ending, I leave thee with this from Clive Staples Lewis. This is the story. What are we to make of Christ? There is no question of what we can make of him. It is entirely a question of what he intends to make of us. You must accept or reject the story. But what you can't do is glibly claim or irresponsibly assert that there is no evidence for the resurrection of Jesus because that, my friends, has been debunked. Adios. So I could have played that for you at the very beginning and we'd have been done by now. But you see, 
the point that I want to make to you is that I think we need some of that stuff that I talked about at the beginning, and I, I would like you to dig even deeper than what I've given you. Because now when you show this video, conversations will start. And if you have even more, now you're able to carry on conversations. And in my humble opinion, that's what evangelism is. It's a conversation, not a presentation. We just converse with people. We're prepared to give an answer for the reason for the hope that lies within us with meekness and fear. And if we can walk away from a meeting where somebody's thinking, mission accomplished. We don't convict or convert. The Holy Spirit does that. We just challenge people to think. I think we've duped ourselves into thinking that I've got to be able to seal the deal every time I talk to somebody. I've got to get another notch on my belt. I led this person to the Lord. Yes, we don't lead anybody to the Lord. That's the Holy Spirit's job. But he uses us. He gives us the privilege, quite frankly, to be that witness. Now, the video is fast. I agree. Those of you that were there yesterday, forgive me. I've got to do a little rehash. Was it done well enough you would watch it again to get a little more information from it? Anybody? Was it done well enough that you're having a conversation and somebody says there's no evidence for the resurrection? You would say, hey, I've got a short video. Would you watch it and then tell me what you think about it? I like making the video the bad guy, right? Because they don't know that I'm the guy behind the videos. When I have these conversations, they mock something. Hey, I got this short video. Would you watch it and tell me what you think about it? It kind of removes me from being the bad guy, right? Like, yeah, yeah, what do you think about these guys? If I give it to you for free, would you take it? All right. For those of you that have not done this, let me give this again, new batch of people here. If you would like to receive the new debunks before I give them out to the general public, you need to take your smartphone out, and I'm going to tell you how to do it very quickly. You're going to send a message, all right? And the message is not difficult at all. Just go to your messaging software. For those of you on an iPhone, this is what it looks like. Androids, I can't help you. There's a green tab that says messages. When you hit that, it takes you to this tab here where you hit a pencil and paper thing, and that will take you to where you can send a message. Now, Android, I don't know what it's called. It's Google something, I'm sure. But anyway, you, it, when you get to that, the recipient that you're going to send this message to is 51555. It's just those numbers, 51555. The message is very simple as well. It's O-M-M. stands for One More Matters. O-M-M. Then the space bar. Please don't write space. You can't believe what I've seen. I've seen all kinds of stuff. O-M-M. Space bar. Carl. You can misspell Carl, but just put that in there. Now, when you send that message, it's going to give you an immediate response back. And all you have to do is hit that link. And that link is going to send you to a landing page. And on that landing page, because this gives us our information to be able to text you a message saying, hey, the new debunked is out. Here's how you can get it, right? But if you want to get our other information, all you have to do, there's a link on there that has a sign up, right? And all you got to do is put uh, your name and your email address, and then uh, notifications that Frank or myself will be speaking in the general area or something like that's going on, you'll receive that from us. You just enter that, and then it's done. Now, to get the current debunked videos, while you've got your smartphone out, if you've not done this before, go to your app store. If you do it on doing the landing page thing, there's a link to it on the landing page. Good, bad, but they both work, Okay. You hit whichever one works for you and look for the blue asterisk on a black background, okay? If you're doing it on a search on, from App Store search, just search for R-F-O-R-H. Stands for Reasons for Hope. R-4-H. And you'll see a blue asterisk on a black background. That's it. Download it. It's absolutely free of charge, guys. I'm not nickel and diamond you. I'm telling you. It is absolutely free of charge. Hours of content. Hours of content. So, please... Take advantage of that. 1 Corinthians 15, he appeared to James and to all the apostles. And I find that interesting. James, right? Who was James? He was a skeptic. Our favorite Jewish historian, Festus was now dead and Albinus was upon the road. So he assembled the Sanhedrin of judges and brought before them the brother of Jesus, who was called Christ, whose name was James. And some others, and when he had formed an accusation against them as breakers of the law, he delivered them to be stoned. Guys, I think this is probably some of the most 
I don't know, overwhelming to me as an individual, as a Christian. I'm reading the Psalms right now. I'm in a Bible study, and we're working our way through the Old Testament, and we're up to the Psalms and reading the Psalms. And I'll tell you the thing that hit me as I read the first, I think it was about 15 Psalms. I've had challenges. There's things in my life that I've had challenges and things like that. But when I read the level that of despair that David went through, and you read the way that he's still calling out glory to God, it's like, I feel so weak. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, I really call myself a Christian? Oh, but Carl, you know, you had people at your job as an air traffic controller. They mocked you. They ridiculed you. You people, they called you names. And then I start reading these Psalms, and I see what happened here, and it's like, oh, my goodness. The, he stoned for his faith. I don't know. If we could somehow get people, me, not you, if I could somehow just understand truly the depth that Christ went to for me, maybe that would be the motivator to get me out of my comfort zone. Because I get in it. I'm not going to lie to you. I wish I could tell you that I had this thing wired. I don't. I'm a fellow pilgrim on the journey of life. But when I read these things and I read the deaths of the apostles and what they went through, guys, Paul was saved about 33 AD. Christ was crucified 30 AD. What was Paul doing for three years? Why was Paul doing this? And what was he hearing between 30 and 33 AD that caused him to want to kill Christians so strongly? We were meeting on a specific day we were singing. I say this as a warning. Crazy's coming. It's reality. It's going to happen. God says as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be before he comes again. How was it in the days of Noah? Every thought was continually wicked. You think it's bad now? No, 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 no. There's still a lot of good. A lot of good going on. But every thought was continually wicked. That's what we've got coming for. And I don't see that out as a discouragement. I say that as a challenge. Christian, if we can trust that Christ died, raised from the dead for us, I think that's what we're going to really need to deal with what's coming. Don't trust me. Go do your own study. You want to buy that book? It's expensive. I bought it. I don't know how long it's going to take me to read it. I'm hunting and pecking through it right now, but I'm going to tell you what, man. This is not an evidence issue. This is a spiritual issue. And if you don't know Christ today, I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit would just break your heart. I mean, we're dead in our trespasses and sin. There's nothing that we can do for Jesus Christ that is worth anything. He has to take that dead heart and give it life. And so if you're one of those with a dead heart today, I'm going to pray that Jesus just breaks that heart and gives you life. Because once he does that, man, things change. I remember who I was before Christ. I remember very clearly who I was. And I'm far from perfect now, but boy, howdy. I thank him for what he's done. So, Father, I lift this up to you. This is not an evidence thing. I don't try to make it an intellectual thing. It's not an evidence thing. It's just not. It's a spiritual issue. But, Father, we do need, in our human frailty, we need evidence sometimes just so that we... No, we shouldn't need it, but it helps to solidify our faith. So, Lord, for the one that's sitting here that doesn't know you, I'm going to pray that you would break their heart. I just pray that you would prick their heart and give it life so that they would be willing to do what you called them to do. I pray that for each of us, that we're each willing to do what you called us to do, which is to be a witness for you. We can't do that in our own strength. We need you for that. So, Lord, I, I offer myself up to you first and foremost. I'm not chucking stones at anybody else. Use us. Even today, I'm going to ask you, Father, that you'd put someone in our path that we can share the gospel with, that we can share the love of Christ with, that we can, through words, through action, whatever it is, we can show a generation that needs hope, hope. Thank you, Father, for this church. Thank you for... Uh, 
Pastor Fred, Pastor Ted, for the team here that's going through all they're doing. I lift up the Christian school to you, Lord. Uh, I, just, I just ask that you would provide for them beyond anything that they could even imagine that they need. This younger generation is so important. So help them to reach this next generation with the truth of your gospel. I give that to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for letting me be with you, Pastor Fred. Just... Thank you very much, Carl, and we very much look forward to what you have to share with us during the morning service. You know, it's 10.07. You've got a little bit of time to uh, stand up, use the restroom, have some fellowship, and then we're going to have service at 10.30. So see you in a few minutes.